podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's Charity Village webinar. We're going to get started in just a moment. Um, we're just going to wait about a minute for it to hit on the hour and uh, let all the people that are joining us from across the country get online today. And I do see that we've got lots of folks signing on right now and we're expecting a full house today so um, we're just going to wait a moment and make sure that everyone gets a chance to get on and settled before we start running through our housekeeping items. For those of, it, of you that are joining just now, welcome. We're going to get started in just a moment. Great. So I think we can uh, go ahead and get started. So hello, everyone. I want to welcome all of you that are joining us today for today's webinar. My name is Marina Dawson. I'm the Marketing and Community Coordinator with Charity Village. And I do want to thank you all for joining us for the second of our three uh, leadership webinars that we're doing uh, early this year. We do have a few housekeeping items before we get started. So first, in order to have the best audio experience for everyone, we do have all of you on mute in order to minimize the amount of background noise that you will hear on today's webinar. While you'll be able to hear us speaking, we're not going to be able to hear you. So we will take questions throughout the session. And if you have a comment or question at any time, please type it into the question box at the bottom of your GoTo control panel that's located to the right of your screen. And that's going to be where you can communicate with us today. We'll do our best to either answer your question right there in the question box or at the end of today's presentation during a short Q&A period. You can also email your questions to webinars at charityvillage.com, and we will do our best to get to as many questions as we can during the Q&A today. If you experience any technical issues that are impacting your ability to see or hear the presentation, also please drop us a note in that question box or by email. We'll keep you updated if we notice anything on our end that might affect your experience. And while we don't anticipate any technical problems, as you know, sometimes the unexpected does happen. So if we do encounter any difficulties today, please just stay put on the session as we get them resolved and we'll continue as quickly as we can. We are recording today's webinar. So if for any reason you're called away during the session or you get disconnected, you will still be able to view the entire presentation afterwards. Please don't worry about taking frantic notes today. You're going to get the full recording by email tomorrow morning, as well as the presentation slides. So you can review all of the information at your convenience. We are also live tweeting today's webinar from at Charity Village on Twitter. We'll be using the hashtag CVWebinar, and I'll put that in the uh, comment box in just a moment. Do feel free to join in there with your comments, questions, and observations. And today, we're very pleased to welcome back Kathy Archer of Silver River Coaching for today's presentation. I'm going to turn things over to Kathy now to get started. Welcome, Kathy. Hi, Marina. Hello, everyone. Hi, Kathy. It's great to have you back today. Yeah. It's good to be back. Wonderful. So I think we can go ahead and dive in. It looks like uh, we've got lots of folks on the on the call today. So why don't we go ahead and get started? I know you've got a lot to cover today. Right. Well, thank you everyone for joining today. If you are here, it's because you know how important it is for your team to reach their full potential. And my guess is it's probably been a bit of a struggle for you to figure out how to do that. Often that's because we've never really been taught how to lead, grow, and develop others. We're great at managing them, well, sometimes anyhow, but leading them to be their best selves is a whole other ball of wax. If you are like many of the leaders that I work with, you at times find this and similar challenges a bit much. Many of the leaders that I work with hit a point where they find themselves in over their heads and wondering if they have what it takes to lead. And that's where their confidence takes a hit. In my work as a leadership development coach, I offer online courses and one-to-one -one coaching sessions where I teach leaders the inner and outer tools to restore their lost confidence so that they can move from surviving to thriving in both their leadership and life. Today, I'll be teaching you some tools to help you inspire your staff to reach their full potential. Now, before we get going, I want to let you know right off the bat that I've taken some additional notes for you today. You'll get the slides, as Marina said. But at the end of today's session, I'm going to share a link with you where you're going to find this three-page summary and a little bit of a bonus. So having said that, I know Marina and I both said don't worry about taking notes, 
But if that's the style of person you are, please do, because that's often how we stay focused and do our best learning. I just didn't want you to miss anything, so I wanted to let you know that I've got you covered. Kathy, I'm All right. going to interrupt you for just one moment. We're just yeah. having a few questions about the audio. Um, you're sounding just a tiny bit far away. Is there any way you can get a little closer to your mic? Sure can. Awesome. Thank you. Is that better? Yep. Let's give that a try. Okay. Yep. Let me know if it's not, and I can adjust it still. Okay. If you take nothing else away from today's webinar, remember this. You are the watering can, the fertilizer, or the sunshine. Your job is to nurture, care for, and grow your employees, even if they drive you crazy, annoy you, and appear not to care. The role you have as a leader is to find that little seed within them and then to help it grow. But in order to do that, and here's the big takeaway from today's session, you must first do that yourself. Grow yourself to reach your full potential, and you'll discover it way easier to help your staff do the same, which of course is why you're here today, right? So let's start with focusing on the problem. The problem is that many of us struggle to unearth our employees' potential. You know that they have more to give. You see that potential in them. You've had those glimpses of that hidden treasure. You've probably tried pointing it out, hinting, or pushing them towards it yet you still aren't finding the success you wish for. You can't seem to draw out their potential and it's frustrating. I had one particular admin staff who had some really great admin skills, but I also noticed how good she was with data analysis. She didn't see it though. And anytime I brought up the idea of her helping out more in that area, she quickly dismissed the idea. And that was so frustrating to me. But here's the thing, if we don't figure out how to help them reach their potential, we might run into some other problems. Let's talk about some risks. But before we do that, Marina, good now? Uh, Kathy, we're still having a few issues. Um, I'm just going to ask, is there any way you might be able to call in? If, if not, it's it's totally fine. Um, I know that some folks are having some issues with the cutting out and that. And that yeah, I just that, need to remember to find the phone number. Sorry, folks, we're going to just try and see if we can uh, get this working a little bit better for you. Um, things were working well in the practice session, but it looks like when we kicked over live, the audio is uh, just a little bit tinny for quite a few folks. So we're going to just, if you can bear with us for a moment, we're going to see if we can switch over to the phone and see if that uh, makes better, makes things better for you. And we are having a lot of questions about whether or not folks are getting the recording and the slide deck, and you are going to get both of those things uh, tomorrow. So you will get that by email. And Kathy is uh, very generously also going to provide a handout for you as well. So we All right. will can you hear me now? have that. Kathy, you sound better. Folks, can you All let us right. know in the chat if that sounds better? Oh, yeah, we're hearing from everyone much better, much better. So I think we okay. can go ahead Let's and continue. Just... Thanks, Kathy. I appreciate that. Okay. Yep. No worries. Let me just move something so I don't knock it over in the middle of this. All right, ready to roll. <laughs> okay, we're talking about the risks now. Great, Kathy, so, we'll just get you to pull up your slide deck in slide view again, too. It looks like we bounced out of that. Um, okay, it looks like I'm in it. So, you're seeing presenter view or slide view? Yeah, we're seeing, pre uh, not presenter view, we're just uh, not in full uh, screen on your slides. Okay. Let's try it again. Now? Uh, no, looks like we're still there. Um, perhaps we need to switch over to Robin. Um, sorry, folks, we're having some technical issues today, but we are going to get let this. Just, uh, let me just double check if I, maybe I'm not showing screen right now. Stop showing screen, show screen. Okay, Kathy, we've got your desktop now. So we might be able to bring that back up and get it going again. Okay. Sorry, guys. Part of life, right? we got to figure this all out. Just hitting play right now. All right. Now what are you seeing? There we go. We're back. All right. Yay. All right. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everybody. Persistence. 
<laughs> right. Well, perhaps there's been a few more that have joined us. We are just talking about the risks of not identifying your employee's full potential. And so there are likely tons, but I've identified a couple here. The first one is that by not revealing the treasures within each of our staff, we of course miss out on those valuable opportunities. We lose their unique input, keen insights, creative ideas, and of course all of their strengths and talents. Second, by failing to uncover what your employee can really do, you may end up with a problem employee. They may feel unseen or overlooked or disrespected. She doesn't even know what I'm capable of. You've probably heard that before. <laughs> they might be bored and just like a bored kid in school, they can become the troublemaker, engaging in office gossip or causing drama. But we could go on and on about the risks. We already know that, that's why we're here. We want them to reach their full potential, but how do you do that? Like, what is their full potential even? Let's begin there. So to help you kind of start considering what your employee's full potential is, I want you to just pick one or two kind of employees that you're thinking about. And I want to ask you this, what is their unrealized potential? And pop a note into the chat box, and I'll maybe get Marina to check it in a few minutes. But what is, you know, if you got your employee to reach their full potential, what might they be doing? And while you're thinking about that and entering a couple ideas into the chat box, let me give you some ideas of what an employee who is reaching their full potential is doing or how they're asking. And I'm going to give you an idea and ask you a question. I'm going to go through these pretty quick, so don't, you know, worry too terribly much about answering every one of them. The whole point is just to get you to be thinking. So. When someone's using their full potential, they're often outperforming their peers. So what does outperforming their peers look like or feel like in your organization? Someone who's reaching their full potential not only gets done what needs to get done, but they might be going the extra mile. So where might your employee be going the extra mile if they were stretching into their full potential? Employees reaching their full potential are always learning something new. So what could your employee be learning if they were striving to reach their full potential? So my guess is I've got your wheels turning, but let me give you a couple more insights. And as I'm doing this, keep throwing ideas into the chat box as you come up with them. So while your employees may not be jumping for joy, you'll know they're reaching their full potential because they're happy. If you are in your zone of potential, not being stretched too far, or having too high of expectations, but in that zone where you are being stretched to a good point, you feel good. You feel valuable, capable, lifted up. And if you've ever had an employee, or maybe felt this yourself, who is eternally bitter, negative, cynical, it's likely because they're somewhere they shouldn't be. They're either stuck in a place that isn't growing them or extracting their very best, or they're being pushed way too far and feeling incapable unsupported or ready to snap. Remember what I said at the beginning, it's your job to nurture, care for, and grow your employees. That means you need to be fully aware of where they are on that continuum. Because when you do your part to keep them somewhere in between bored and overwhelmed, you'll find that they're in their zone of potential. They'll be happy and you will fall in love with them. You'll appreciate them, notice their efforts and probably be more accepting of their faults. You will seek them out for new opportunities and be drawn to supporting them and helping them. They still won't be perfect. Let's not, you know, try and assume something like that. But they, that piece won't matter as much because their intent will be there and you'll find so much value in that. Remember I said they're gonna be asking questions, jumping in to help out. It's their inner desire to be their best selves that makes them more appealing to be around. So if that's what you're looking for, type a big old yes in the chat box. Marina, we're still good on your end? Yes, sounds great, Kathy. Okay, and are we getting a few comments about what people want to see in their full potential? Yeah, we do. Um, so here's a couple. We've got um, the employee would be proactive in handling donor issues. Uh, okay. They would move more into management than production. Uh, ah. Be highly engaged. Uh, let's see here, being proactive in identifying potential gaps in processes, 
Uh, Great example. Yeah. Okay, keep throwing those in, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's jump in with some of the tools you can use that just maybe might help you fall in love with your employee and get them to reach the full, their full potential. So we're going to look at motivate, inspire, coach, and mentor. And I'll describe what each of these are because we often use them interchangeably and they're not exactly the same thing. And just a note, there's tons of definitions for these terms. Don't get too caught up in how my definition may differ slightly from what you've heard in the past. Just simply focus on how you can apply it. Okay, motivating employees. People will often ask how they can motivate employees. However, that's actually the wrong question. Honestly, you can't motivate anybody. But what you can do is create an environment in which employees choose motivation. So as I go through this, consider how you can create a motivating environment. So let's begin by looking at first what it means to motivate someone by looking at the root word. I'm kind of a geek that way. I'm always looking up words in the dictionary. So the root word is motive. When you motivate someone, you are giving them a motive for doing something. Motivate is a verb. Motive is a noun, a person, place, or thing. Remember that back in the day? It's the reason. It's the motive that causes them to act. And so you'll hear people's motives when they talk or when they're talking about other people. I'm driven, or what drives you? What's the incentive? Consider what spurred someone on. Notice when you can identify someone's agenda. So always come back to what is my employee's motive? And remember, it's a noun, a person, place, or thing in each situation. And the other thing to remember is that it won't be the same for everyone. Feeling motivated is a push or pull kind of feeling. And here's the truth about motivation. It's not always a good feeling. How many people do you know that love Mondays? Probably not very many. The truth is, most of us are motivated to come to work on Monday, but we are not necessarily chipper about it. I just want one more day off echoes across the country on Monday mornings. However, the motive of the bills that need paid, the client's needs, the desire not to let the team down, that's what activates us to go out the door. I am motivated most days to go for a walk because I know it's good for my physical and mental health. However, I don't always want to go. Lots of times I have to use my willpower to get my butt out the door. I literally have to talk myself into it. You would laugh if you could hear the conversation going on in my head. Happy, get going. Oh, it's cold. Yes, but you'll warm up as soon as you go. But I have so much to do. Yes, and you'll be way more productive after you go for a walk. Come on, let's go. You probably have similar conversations in your head. It's the same how we talk ourselves into going to work each day. We're motivated, pulled or pushed, but maybe not necessarily feeling fabulous about it. So it's important to understand that we are motivated in two directions. First, we may be motivated by pushing away from something we don't want. We don't want to get fired. We don't want to get yelled at, embarrassed, or ridiculed. And those of us who are skilled procrastinators are often motivated by the deadlines. The other direction we are motivated is when we are pulled towards something we do want. The gold stars, positive feedback, accolades. Money to a point pulls us towards it. The other thing to think about in terms of motivation is to consider whether we are motivating someone with external or internal motivators. Extrinsic or external motivation is doing something for those external rewards, the negative consequences like we just talked about. Sometimes we're wanting the approval, accolades, or acknowledgement from others, but it's something outside of us that's spurring us into action. Or we are motivated by something inside of us. Intrinsic motivation is when you do something because you enjoy it or find it interesting. It comes from inside of you. We feel good. It pulls us. Think of pride. I am one of the rare people who enjoys shoveling snow. I know. You might even be able to hear the, uh, I don't know if you guys can hear that, but in the background we have the plows right now backing up and loading up the snow in our driveway so it's a little bit I apologize if you can hear that 
but I'm one of those people who enjoys shoveling. And there, there's always the external motivation to do that. I don't want my mother-in-law to slip on the ice when she comes over. I kind of want my yard to look as good as the neighbors. And of course, I don't want to get stuck. But I'll let you in on a little secret. I am more motivated by internal motivators. When we have a big dump of snow and I get out there and clean it up, it feels good. I'm proud of my work. In fact, I take great pride in making sure it looks nice. No one tells me to do it. No one expects it of me. In truth, I don't even think half my family notices much that I've done it. But I don't do it for them. I do it for me. Anybody's like that? If you've got some of those things that um, motivate you internally, just, you know, make a, a, a note in the chat box about what kind of motivates you internally, because we want to keep an eye on some of those things. So motivation is to provide someone with a motive or a cause or a reason to act. And there are external and internal motivators, and we either tend to be pushed or pulled. So often when we're thinking about an employee who's trying to reach their full potential, not always, but often, they have their sights set on moving up their career ladder, or we want to move them up the career ladder. But they'll either be pushing away from something they don't like, shift work, the mundane of front line, and or at the same time being pulled towards something they desire, higher pay, more fulfilling work. So certainly lots to consider when you look at what motivates employees, but it's honestly worth the time to consider. So I'm going to move on to inspiration. Anything I need to know about, Marina, before I keep going? No, everything's going great. Thanks, Kathy. Okay. So frequently used in the same sentence as motivation is inspiration. So let's talk about how they differ, though. While motivation is often, and we've just seen not always, but often it's that external force that moves people into action, inspiration is more of an internal feeling. So remember, when you are motivated, you aren't always happy about it. But inspiration evokes that kind of warm glow. You feel excited, proud, or purposeful. People often feel called to do something. And we often hear that people feel inspired by someone else. And the reason isn't so much that other person, but the other person's actions or story that evoke that inspiration within that other person. So a little while back, I posted a picture of a full journal that I had done on social media. I'd written it every single day. Every page had been filled. And I described how I used it to vision what I want for my students every day. And somebody in social media commented that it was inspiring. Here's the thing. The reason I posted this picture was this. What I want for my students and my clients is for them to do more reflection. The act of pondering is how you discover what's going on inside of you and gives you more control of what you say and do and the impact you have. If I was trying to motivate them, I'd simply tell them to journal every day, remind them how important it was, I'd tell them about what the outcomes they could expect from it. I'd probably, and actually do in my training courses, I would you know, tell them how to build a habit of journaling every day. Here though, in this post, I wasn't trying to motivate them, I was trying to inspire them. By my story of being able to successfully journal every day, I was hoping to evoke something inside of them. I wanted them to think, man, if she can fit, fit daily journaling into her day, maybe I can too. So consider the people you know who have, may have inspired you or other people. Mother Teresa's strength, despite so many challenges, invites us to weather our storms. Neil Armstrong inspired us to reach our potential. Heck, if we can send the man to the moon, why can't we fill in the blank, right? Gandhi showed us how to achieve dreams without violence. He inspires us to be compassionate and love everyone. Oprah, a black woman in a racist country, inspired us to overcome our challenges with grace. It's their stories of what they accomplished that makes us wonder what we can do. So inspiration often comes from stories of change or transformation, weight loss, the underdog who won the Olympic medal, people with disabilities who climb mountains either literally or figuratively. <clears throat> it's their story of who they became as a result of what they went through that inspires us. So again, here's my geeky part coming out. When we break apart the word inspired, we often find it comes from two words, in spirit. The word literally means in spirit. 
So in other words, when you are inspired by something, it means that you are living in alignment with your spirit. And it's not necessarily a religious reference, it's that inner spirit though. So when I think of wild horses, I think of their spirit. They're strong and passionate, they're spirited. Consider the opposite, weak, broken, tamed, subdued. That certainly doesn't sound like an employee who's reaching their full potential. So take a moment now to just kind of think about something that you do that awakens your spirit. Perhaps it's going for a walk in nature, painting, gardening, singing, petting your puppy. Can you feel that inner connection? And now think of something you do at work that evokes a similar feeling. Might be a little bit more difficult to conjure up, but there are times when you get that warm glow in your work, when you get that passionate feeling. That's when your spirit is awakened and you often feel passionate. I was doing some training with a team recently about how to navigate the massive changes in their organization. They'd recently watched several of their colleagues be walked off the job without any notification at all. They'd come to work one day and they were told to pack their belongings as they were done. Of course, it was a budget reduction strategy, right? but it was one that had massive unintentional impacts on the rest of the employees. So as we worked through the day on surviving change, we talked a lot about survivor stories, about stories they had been through or others had been through in the past where they made it through change. And it was those stories that helped them to rekindle their passion for their work. They were inspired by each other's stories and they started to see the upcoming changes in a new and creative way. So we are often both motivated and inspired at the same time. I completed this PowerPoint for two reasons. One, I was motivated because I didn't want to let Marina and all of you guys down. I was also inspired because I know that most leaders want to do better and that they have that inner desire to be their best selves. And the reason they're not always there is that they've never been taught how to lead effectively. I got so frustrated when they move people into leadership or supervisory positions and train them how to do the job, but not how to lead people, which is a completely different skill, perhaps even an art, than managing people. And that stokes that inner passion, you can probably hear it now because I get really frustrated, that inner passion in me to find the best way to teach you and inspire you to be your best self. It excites me, activates me, and propels me into action. There, I finish the webinar presentation, and I'm moving into reaching my full potential. So again, to summarize, motivation, think about the reasons or motives that spur them into action. And again, remember it's a two directional thing. So ask yourself what will drive them? What are they moving towards and what are they pushing away from? But more than just motivating others, ask yourself how I can inspire them. Consider story, or transformations that you can share that might evoke something inside of them. And it can be yourself or others. What have other teens or leaders done? Have they turned their toxic work environment around? Perhaps they had a policy that didn't work and they did their homework, presented alternatives to management, and that evoked change in the policy. I'm gonna have a quick drink, Marina, before we move on to coaching, but if there's anything I need to know, let me know. Uh, things are going along great. Just a reminder to everyone, if you have questions for Kathy, do type them in the chat box and we'll uh, do our best to get to as many as possible at the Q&A at the end of today's session. Great. Thanks, Kathy. All right. <clears throat> yep, I will be here to answer questions as long as you guys and Marina are there to ask them. All right. Let's now shift gears and talk about how we can coach our employees. A coach draws wisdom from within a person. Often people do know what they should be doing. They even know how to do it, or at least where to start or who to ask for help. What they lack is awareness of those answers or the courage to do it. When you non-judgmentally coach an employee by asking powerful questions, you awaken something inside of them, their potential. As a leader, we tend to do a lot of telling. Coaching is different. It's focused on asking. If you're wondering what the difference is between training and coaching, Think of it this way. Training is a transfer of knowledge, whereas coaching is enhancing current knowledge or skills. Coaching is not manipulative, 
micromanaging, telling, directing, or controlling. It is helping the employee become more aware, and it's that increased awareness that helps them have a boost of their self-confidence, capacity, and yes, their potential. So John Whitmore, who was the pioneer in the coaching profession, said it like this. I am able to control only that which I am aware of. That which I am unaware of controls me. Awareness empowers me. I'm going to say that one more time. I am able to control only that which I am aware of. That which I am unaware of controls me. Awareness powers me. Many of us think of our job as a leader is to know everything. However, most of the answers, solutions, and ideas lie within our people and teams. When we coach them, we empower them to think differently and to solve the problems they're experiencing, thus releasing their inner wisdom. Here's the thing, though. Coaching requires that you trust that your employees indeed do have that inner wisdom, and you have the confidence that they'll come up with the solutions that suit both themselves and the organization. Most employees, and I'd argue us as well probably, are only performing in our comfort zone. We do okay, but have so much more to offer. When we coach people, we help them to identify their unique strengths and weaknesses, tying those to their personal and career aspirations. The coaching process then stretches them and gets them to do things outside of their comfort zone. That kind of stretching makes people proud, excited, inspired to do more. Here's just a side note. If you want to do more stretching yourself out of your comfort zone, go back to the webinar that I did, that I did last year here for Charity Village for Confidence Boosters to reach your full potential because I think that's a great place to start to build on what we're talking about today. So think of your job when you're coaching an employee as that of helping them to sort of reveal their potential to them. You may have caught glimpses of it, but they may be either unaware of it or afraid to show it. You have to wake them up to what's inside of them, uncover it, and help them become more aware of that. You do that by asking open and powerful questions. Remember, you're helping them to become more aware. Every one of us has our own perspectives, judgments, views, lenses, and that leads us to tunnel vision. As you ask coaching questions, you help them unpack those viewpoints and perspectives and their own perceptions of themselves and others. We all have blind spots. When you're coaching someone, you're helping them to see around those blind spots. Many of us don't feel worthy, capable, or able because somewhere we've heard we're not and we've become attached to that belief. You're, you'll never be leadership material. You're not good at speaking in public. Your spelling and writing is horrible. You can't handle stress. But by asking powerful questions, you'll help them to see that those maybe are old beliefs that are no longer true or helpful. Your questions start to evoke the desire in themselves to see themselves or the situation differently. A great example uh, of coaching comes from the sports example in, again, John Whitmore's book, Coaching for Performance. Our tendency, again, when we're helping someone to grow, is to tell them what to do. We offer directives such as, keep your eye on the ball, watch it as it comes to you. When we do ask questions, they seem to have an accusatory tone to them. Are you watching the ball? Why aren't you watching the ball? <laughs> We've all heard this before. These kind of questions will likely put people on the defense. Here's how it shows up in our work world. Don't forget to complete that report. I need it by tomorrow. Or did you finish the report? And you can feel how those put someone on the defensive. But Whitmore asks us to consider the effect of the following kinds of questions. Which way is the ball spinning when it comes towards you? How high is it as it crosses the net? How far is your opponent away when you first see which way the ball is spinning? Can you feel the difference? These questions help the individual to become more aware of themselves. So in this case, where they're standing perhaps, and their surroundings, the ball, the net, or their opponent. It's not about the right way or the wrong way or being good or bad. 
It's about what they need to become more aware of so they can grow. No judgment needed. So back to the report example. Your coaching questions could be, what do you need to get help with so that you can finish that report by tomorrow? Or what will help you to find an hour to focus on that report? Again, do you feel the difference? The key to good coaching is non-judgmental and open curiosity. We need to tame the advice monsters and tell less and ask more. So for example, if a team lead comes to you complaining about one of their employees who's refusing to cover a shift, your first instinct, of course, might be to tell them how to handle it. Well, have you told her that she has to cover that shift? Did you make sure she ex that you explained what she needs to do if she can't? Kind of the way we tend to respond, right? However, when you shift to coaching questions, again, you can feel a different tone. What else is going on for Cindy that might be getting in the way of her covering the shift? How do you want to handle this so you can feel positive about the conversation no matter the outcome? And maybe your employee might be respond by saying fair or professional or maybe open. You could follow up with another coaching question. What helps you to have an open mind when you go into those types of conversations? Can you feel how instead of just solving the problem, fire, crisis, whatever it is, that you're being more intentional, intentional about growing that team leader's skills as a leader. Again, coaching really helps them to reach their full potential. Here is the big, big tip though. Ask one question at a time and then be quiet and wait. Patience is a virtue. It is also a learned skill for an effective coach. I kid you not, when I was taking my coach training, we learned about the skill of being quiet. We practiced it, which is oh, so hard to do. And we were evaluated on our abilities to do it. Silence is golden in more ways than you can imagine. So practice being quiet. Here are some more questions to get you going. Start with something like, what's on your mind today? Or what are you challenged with today? And then keep them talking by saying things like, what else? Tell me more. Remember, we are taming the advice monster here. Help them to identify what's really going on by asking, what's the real challenge for you here? And if you need, you could elaborate and say, is it that you don't know how to write that, you don't have time, or something totally different? You could ask, what part of this do you need to figure out? What resources do you need to help you make that decision? What strengths will you draw upon to help you? What worked, what didn't, and what do you need, what did you learn? All of these questions don't suppose that you have the answer, but that they have it within them. Remember, when you are coaching someone, you are drawing wisdom from that inner person. All right, I'm gonna move on, Marina. If there's anything, let me know. Just having a quick drink. All right, we've got lots of wonderful questions coming in for the Q&A, so. Okay, perfect. <laughs> okay. Switching gears, this is the fourth one. Let's take a look at mentoring. Think of mentoring a bit like taking someone under your wing and then imparting your wisdom onto them. They are looking up to you with respect because you are a wise sage. In some cases, they hang on your every word. Okay, well maybe not quite that amazing, but you get the point. Mentoring is about a relationship where someone has more experience than the other and shares that knowledge with the other person. It's more than just teaching though. You can have a teacher that you don't respect, don't like their style and have no desire to be like. In a mentoring relationship, the mentee looks up to the mentor and tries to emulate them in some way. When my team ventured into new territory, picking up contracts to support individuals with FASD, I knew little about the field of FASD. However, I was experienced in building relationships in the community, often with other organizations who had felt like they had had their funding pulled because we got the contract. I'd often have mentoring conversations with my team lead about how to tactfully talk to so-and-so at this particular organization, or I might suggest she attend a specific meeting even though it seemed redundant because we needed to be seen as available to other agencies. It was part of me mentoring her, she respected me and she wanted to learn from me. And that's the one key thing about mentoring, is you must have a strong relationship with that person. 
if you try to impart your wisdom on someone who dislikes you, doesn't respect you or your style, it could very well come across as lecturing and possibly arrogant. So remember, coaching is about helping your employees become more aware, and it's that increased awareness that helps boost self-confidence, capacity, and yes, their potential. So when you're curiously asking those powerful questions, consider, what can I help them to become more aware of? And when you are mentoring, look at what information, knowledge, or experience you can share. Focus on building your relationship with people that might already look up to you. Consider what they see in you and that you want to emulate. Teach them how to do that. Okay, so now you know about the four different ways to get their staff to their full potential. There's two mindset shifts you need to make. Your mindset is the way you see things, your perspective or attitude about something, and it's that view that you adopt of other people or situations that profoundly affects the way things go. Often the way we see our employees is a problem that needs to be fixed. We look at what's wrong with them, their deficits, and their weaknesses. Instead, I want you to cultivate a mindset that helps you to see your employees as having assets that need to be uncovered. Try to think about finding that pearl inside your employee. We have a, one lady in an organization that I'm involved with that drives everyone nuts. Seriously. She's aggressive, demeaning, and scattered. Most people would like to get rid of her. But, or maybe rather, and, she is brilliant. She has a deep passion for the work we do. We just need to figure out how to find the skills that are underneath all that contentious energy and help her put it to good use. The second mindset shift that's going to help you be more capable of getting your employees to their full potential is this mindset that we have that they will never change. We often have that fixed mindset. Here's an example. This picture could easily have been me years ago. Every other Sunday, you would likely find me at my kitchen table working on timesheets the staff had submitted. In addition to their hours that they work on, they'd attach what was called client and program activities. They chart what they did with their time so that I could compile it and send it in a month end to our funders for outcomes reporting. The problem was there were so many errors and that took me forever to review and sign off. But what was I doing? I was just fixing their errors. I wasn't teaching them anything. I was not holding them accountable for their accuracy because in my mind I kept saying, they're never gonna change, so why bother? The new mindset we need to adopt is a growth mindset. We need to believe about ourselves and about others that we can always learn and grow. Yes, it could take some time. It's probably gonna take a lot of effort and it might not be easy. There's gonna be mistakes, failures, errors. And if we persist over time, we can learn to do pretty much anything. All right, which brings us back to motivating, inspiring, and coaching and mentoring. I want to give you some tools here quickly to um, help you apply this. But before I do that, one quick note. You cannot expect anyone to grow or develop further if this baseline is not met. You must ensure or at least work really hard to make sure that your employees have decent wages, adequate resources, and reasonable workload. And I know that is not always possible in nonprofits and charities, but do your best and communicate your advocacy efforts to your employees. They want to know that you are on their side rooting for them. Okay, the tools. And I'm gonna go through these pretty quick, but you're gonna get a summary at the end, like I say, so you'll get to see these for you as well. Tool number one, role model what you want. Remember, you cannot make someone be motivated, but you can create an environment in which the employee chooses motivation. That starts with you setting a good example. If you want motivated employees who reach their potential, show them what it looks like. Be that inspiration. Do your employees go home at the end of the day and grumble about you? Or do they say something like, man, she's got a tough job, but I'd like to have her tenacity, patience, persistence, faith, grace, conflict resolution skills, organization's abilities, or loyalty. Do have an employee ever said to you, why? Are you so confident when you speak to a group? I wish I could have that level of comfort speaking in public. Have you reached your full potential? Do you role model everything you desire in your employees? 
So here's the action that you need to do. Make a list of the key traits you want to see in your employees. And then ask yourself, what can I do to improve those traits in myself? Second tool, get really, 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 really curious. Remember, lead with questions, not answers, right? So you're getting your employee to be thinking differently, coming up with their own ideas. The action I want you to take is learn to ask more and better questions. So start with asking yourself what we talked about at the beginning. What drives your employees? Pause and ponder for a bit about your staff. What are that employee's inner drivers and how can you activate those drivers? I know some of you are trying to write these. Trust me, Marina will send out the slides after. It's all good. <laughs> all right, tool number three, let them lead. You don't always have to be in control. If you want them to reach their full potential, you need to give them the opportunity to step into, to practice, and yes, to fail. Let them lead. The action I need you to take here is get the heck out of their way. <laughs> Sometimes we just get in our employees' way. And so again, take a moment and ask yourself, what responsibility can I give this employee that will potentially make them feel prouder and more capable, right? So if you're wanting them to lead, give them that opportunity to feel that. Tool number four, let them learn. In order to step into new places, do things differently and reach their potential, they're gonna need to learn new skills, talents, and ways of being. And you need to give them the opportunity to learn those things. And here's a couple things to remember. You may not always be the best teacher, and it might take some time for them to learn these new skills. The action I need you to take is ensure that your employees are always learning something new. That doesn't mean to stretch them too far and make them snap, but move them a little bit outside their comfort zone. Give them opportunities to try new things that are gonna grow them. Find you, to help you find the training that may stretch your staff, ask your employee this. If I could offer you any training relevant to our programs and your interest, what would you love to take? And then figure out how to make it happen. But work with them to be creative. I was talking with a client the other day who really wanted to take an expensive storytelling course. But the more we talked about it, she realized she didn't really need this day-long big event that was gonna you know, pull her away from the office for the day. What she really needed to, was to get this particular speaker's book read it and apply the techniques daily in her work. And that was gonna help her more than actually going to this big event. Tool number four, give them autonomy. Allow them to be in control as much as you can. Always having your staff under your thumb does not give them room to grow. And again, expect the flub ups, the big boo-boos, and even some things that seem like disasters. You probably made a few along the way too. And look at what you've learned from them and how you grew. Yes, it requires you to let go. <laughs> so the action is to give your employees more decision-making authority. Take time to ponder again. What choices can I give my employee? And, and this is a key part of this, what boundaries need to be placed around those choices? We're not letting them get away with whatever and do whatever, but within the parameters of their job, and maybe even a little bit beyond, what choices can they make? Tool number five, help them be purposeful. No one ever said, when I grow up, I want to be a warm body. I just want to fill up a job because they need someone in it. No, everyone wants to do meaningful work. They want to be needed. Your job is to help them feel that way. Most people didn't come to work in a charity organization or, or a nonprofit because the pay was great. They came because they cared. In fact, they cared deeply about it. And we need to remind them of that, connect them to that, awaken that sense of purpose and meaning. So help your employees feel like they're making a difference. So ask, what brings meaning to the work my employee is doing? And don't just ask yourself, but ask them. Talk about the bigger picture of your work, not just the tasks that need done today, but why does your team do those tasks? Include it as part of staff meetings. What's been meaningful to you this past month? So there we go. 
motivate, inspire, coach, and mentor. That's going to help your employees reach their full potential, and these are the tools that you can use to do that. Make sure you are role modeling what you want for them. Get really, really, really curious. Let them lead, let them learn, give them autonomy, and help them be purposeful. And don't forget, I've taken the notes. Here's the link, we'll send it to you at the end. But one of the things I just want to make sure you know is that I've included a bonus sheet when you come grab this um, that is 10 powerful coaching questions because I think that's one of the keys that many of you are going to be looking for is how do I ask these coaching questions because I know that's what is one of the big things that helps people grow to their full potential. So remember, I'll, set, I'll add that link in a minute. Don't panic. I'll, I'll share it in a second. Remember, you are the watering can, the fertilizer, and the sunshine. Your job is to nurture, care for, and grow your employees. But before you do that, you must first grow yourself to reach your full potential. Become the person you want your staff to be. Then you will put yourself in a place to mentor them and be an amazing inspiration to them. So thank you all for joining. Again, I know that we're going to hang on and answer some questions. And here's the sheet that has the uh, link to it. And Marina's going to send this link out as well when you get the replay. But this is the download that you can grab. And Marina. Where are we at? Wonderful. Well, even with our little hiccups, we're like sitting right on time. So this is fantastic. We've got a good 10 minutes for Q&A. So it's great. Perfect. Uh, I'm going to dive right in. Our first question, do you have tips for coaching an employee who is actually overperforming, but overperforming to a degree that they're actually kind of drowning in their work? Mm. Did you say tips for coaching an employee? Yeah. Do you have any strategies or anything, you, any advice you could offer there? Yeah. I think I think part of it, again, is uh, is helping them to become aware that they're overperforming and drowning. And so it's asking questions that are going to help them to notice their energy levels, um, their, um, their ability to complete all the tasks that they're trying to perform to their best ability, right? Um, you know, the, the, sometimes it's questions like, if if you were doing this job at your best, what might it what might be you doing differently, and what do you need to do to that level of work? Um, and what you're going to try and uncover is, you know, well, yeah, I can't do it because I've got way too many things on my plate. Um, and sometimes you need to point that out to them. So that's why we're looking at coaching, mentoring, inspiring, and and um, whatever other one I missed, <laughs> it's because it's not always a coaching conversation, right? Sometimes it is that conversation where you say, look, here's what's happening. This is what we're seeing. And once you've kind of laid sort of the, the, the reality of what's going on on the line, then you can coach them to change things around. Great. And um, lots of folks are asking, how, what types of questions can you ask to discover an employee's push-pull motivations? Uh, that, what pushes you, what pulls you? <laughs> and that's, it's really important to ask those questions. And again, one of the really fun things is to, when you get the response, I don't know, that's a great answer. And that's a perfect time to be quiet and wait. Um, because what we often do is we want to fill up the space. But it's that curiosity that you've evoked inside of them that helps them to go, huh, I don't know. Let me think about that for a second. What does motivate me? What pulls me? What pushes me? Um, you know, and, and I think sometimes when we can give examples to that helps. So like I was saying about, you know, me going for a walk, um, you know, why do I go for a walk every day? It certainly isn't because I feel really excited and I jump up every day and I'm running out the door. There's there's a push in me that's kind of pushing me out the door. And so I have to go, oh, what is that all about? Um, but it's asking that, what pushes you, what pulls you, what drives you? Um, sometimes it's coming back to, why did you come to this job in the first place? What motivated you to get into this line of work? Take that course in school, um, apply for this position. Uh, what's the difference you want to make? Uh, why um, is it so important that you make that difference? and just helping them to kind of dig deeper and deeper and deeper. And again, silence is an amazing thing. The more often you can say, yeah, think about it for a sec. Or one of the other things I'll often say to people is, 
um, yeah, you don't know the answer, but just throw out whatever first comes to your mind, right? Um, and, you know, suddenly some words come out and they're like, oh, I don't know where that came from, but it gives you a direction to start going down. Wonderful. And um, Kathy, maybe you could discuss just a little bit again about the example of um, motivating versus inspiring. And I know you used the example of working with your students. Could you maybe just uh, repeat that a little bit, uh, dig into that a bit more? Yeah. So when we're motivating people, we're often looking at um, the drivers. Um, and I think this is where the two get confused because we're talking about intrinsic and extrinsic you know, motivation. And so often that internal motivation is akin to inspiration. Um, so when you're trying to motivate somebody, again, looking at what, what spurs them into action, and so kind of go back and look at, well, what spurred them into action last time? Well, the deadline did, right? Or the, the you know, <laughs> when, when I invoked the fear of God into them or when they thought they were going to lose their job or whatever. There was something that kind of motivated them into action and kind of go back to that and look at that. The inspiration piece is, again, more about, um, it's more about transforming the person they are. And so if if this is a person who is, I know lots of times we have sort of negative Nelly in our organizations and, uh, you know, eternally sort of bitter and, uh, you know, creates that cesspool of negativity and gossip and all that kind of stuff. And so maybe you can see sort of, you know, I used to feel that way. I used to be the one that was gossiping in Smoker's Corner and I used to be, you know, always complaining about so and so and so. And it wasn't until I started to go, but how can I make change myself? How can I see this differently? And so that inspires them to go, oh, really? Like you changed? Like the boss never changed? It was you that changed? That sometimes evokes that in people when they can start to see that difference between um, who you became as a result of sort of seeing things differently. So again, inspiration is often about sort of our, our traits and our personality and, and who we are as a being and who we became to achieve things. And it's often those stories of trans. Information. I mean, think of inspirational movies or why we watch TED Talks or YouTube videos galore. Um, you know, it's that because that person changed. And that's what inspiration is. What did that person, how did that inner person change and who did they become to achieve their goals? Great. And um, this is a, a, an interesting question here. Um, so this leader is uh, saying that they had an employee who applied for um, a higher level job, a supervisory job, but didn't get it. And now the leader is wondering how they can um, continue to inspire and coach this uh, employee while they may be feeling a bit unmotivated or a bit disappointed that they didn't at this time receive that promotion. One of my biggest frustrations in organizations is we only look as far as the nose on our face. <laughs> I think where we struggle is we often look at the next step. And so what I would encourage you to do with this employee and all of our employees, in fact, is look at the next three or four or six steps ahead of us. Where do you want to be in five years? Where do you want to be in three years? Um, and so here was a, you know, I talked many times throughout today's presentation, we all have failures and we all mess up and we all, um, you know, don't get exactly what we want, but it's those things that teach us and grow us. But when we focus in and have this tunnel vision on this failure defines me, that's when we struggle. It's when we step back and look at the bigger picture and say, okay, you know, I applied on this position and I really, really wanted it because it was going to take me here. Well, let's talk about where there is and where that was going to lead you to. And create this, you know, when we're talking about the push-pull, one of the things that I often start out in my work is creating a powerful vision. You know, where do you want to be and create that? I talk about it in my book as like a vision movie. It's not just like I want to be the executive director or I want to run my own business, it's I want to be making a difference in my work. I want to be meeting with employees every day and feeling like I can take this work and connect with other organizations and create that powerful vision that includes all of your senses. You know, I hear the engaging conversation and I feel my heartstrings tugged when I know I have to make a budget decision and it's not easy. 
and you create that powerful vision of the future, that's what pulls us through those difficult times. Um, I often use the example of weight loss. If anybody thinks it's easy to go on a weight loss journey, they're nuts. We all know that there are donuts on the middle of the boardroom table and there are chocolate bars at the convenience store and there are wonderful displays of trays at Christmas time. You have to figure out how to get through each of those humps and bumps along the way. And it's not always easy. But the vision of either the bikini on the beach, or for me, it's getting on the floor and wrestling with my grandkids that wants me to keep a healthy weight, that vision is what pulls you forward. And so when you can create that powerful vision, despite the bumps and humps of, I didn't quite get today's job, that's what will we'll get that employee re-engaged and looking at, okay, what else can I do now to get towards that bigger vision? Thanks, Kathy. And for our final question today, um, and I think this is a, a really good one, is there a way that uh, people that maybe aren't in a leadership position uh, use some of these tips that you've provided today to help inspire even up the management chain? Ooh, very good question. Yes, 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 and yes. <laughs> I think, again, the more we do this ourselves, that we role model for the people around us, whether it's down, sideways, or up. And so when you start to stretch into your full potential, um, then you'll start to see where you have the ability to inspire other people. I, years ago, worked on my management degree. It took me eight years to get my management degree. I was the first one in our organization to do that. And it inspired people you know, across the, the the hierarchy chart as well as people above me that they kind of went oh you know Kathy had four kids was working full-time as a leader and you know course by course by course she worked on her degree maybe we can start to you know look at how we can support other people in our organization to do that uh, certainly you can use coaching questions with other people uh, and and I don't think it's I'm coaching this person I think the key to any of this is curiosity. Just simply be curious. Don't try to solve problems. Don't try to fix things. Don't try to, um, you know, tell people how to do it. But simply get curious. So when you're in the middle of a, a conversation with your boss or up the management path, get really curious. You know, I think what we tend to do again is have this narrow tunnel vision. They want me to do this and I better get it done by this date or this way. And when you start to go, you know, I hear that you, you know, need this done. Are there any other ways that we can look at doing this? Or what's the impact that this have? And, and you know, what else might get us that impact? Or is it the impact we desire? And so just simply being non-judgmental, not attached to, to the outcome, but getting curious, that'll help you in all facets of your life. Great. Well, I want to thank you again, Kathy, for coming back and presenting for us today. It's, it's been a real pleasure having you back again this year. You're welcome. Great. So just before we sign off today, I do want to remind you all that we are going to follow up with you by email tomorrow with the webinar recording. So watch for that in your inbox uh, tomorrow morning. If you don't see that, feel free to drop us an email at webinars at charityvillage.com. Sometimes those emails do get caught in spam filters. So in that case, we can send it to you directly. Uh, in that email that we send out tomorrow, there's going to be a link to a short survey. So if you can just take a moment and fill that out, it's very helpful for us. Uh, you'll have an opportunity there to let us know if there's other topics you'd like to see covered in a future session as well. We do have one more webinar coming up in our 2018 leadership series. Uh, that's going to be uh, quite a good follow-up to this one, actually, uh, on providing uh, feedback to staff and volunteers that is engaging and motivating. Uh, and we're going to have registration information for that in the email that we send out tomorrow as well, in case you're interested in joining us for that one. So with that, I want to let you all get back to your day. Thank you again for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone.